the constellations and asterisms. You're all familiar with the term constellation, maybe not so much with asterism. Well, the constellations date from antiquity, where life at those times was a lot more harsh than we generally know it today. And it pertained to what they had to deal with, wars and conquests and agriculture, survival, growing food, getting fish, killing animals to, to eat. So what they saw up in the heavens in their non-scientific mindset, or the science of the day at least, which wasn't of course very advanced, were star arrangements, the brighter stars, that they perceived as patterns relating to their life. And of course even in the figure over here you can see the mythology associated with it because I don't think anybody actually saw or was a centaur depending on how you would say that but this is where the constellations come from and it's proved to be useful right up to the current time because it enables us to describe events in the heavens in certain geographic regions and so when we say a, a new supernova was found in the constellation Ophiuchus, we know where to look up in the night sky. And if it's a recognizable pattern, you will be able to find it relatively easily, as opposed to it being a very difficult thing to do and having to find charts and graphs and all that kind of thing. So that's the constellations. But now it's come a, become a little more precise. And the constellations are actually a jigsaw puzzle of 88 well-defined regions determined by the International Astronomical Union. And it covers the entire sky with all these jigsaw geographical boundaries for the various constellations. Doesn't matter even particularly where the bright stars are. So there's, they're very well specified. Here's an example of a couple of them. We have Andromeda and Pegasus and the great square of Pegasus and here's a star that's shared between two constellations. So how are the stars of the constellations named? Well here's a very familiar constellation, Orion. This is a excessively exposed image of Orion in all of its beauty. Well, there's a very bright star in the upper left, which is Betelgeuse, that red star, and it is the Alpha Star. And we also have Rigel, which is the Beta Star. You might recognize as Alpha and Beta as being part of the Greek alphabet. So they were named by a Greek letter according to the relative brightness, the brightest one in general being Alpha, kind of like the Alpha male. So it's within a constellation you have these designations plus the possessive form of the name of the constellation so we have Betelgeuse is Alpha Orionis Rigel is Beta Orionis etc. So that's the general pattern in the stars of the constellations. Well what's a good way to find some of these stars which in the same sense is finding the constellations associated with them. Well the Big Dipper offers us a wonderful guide as a case in point because it's easy to find in the northern hemisphere and you can use it as a guide to discover the locations of a few of the other constellations. So for instance if you follow the handle of the Big, of the Big Dipper at Arcs to Arcturus then you can speed on to Spica of Virgo Arcturus being the alpha star of Boötes, I think that's how you pronounce it. Moreover, the two stars in the Dipper itself point to Polaris, the North Star, which is a very special star, as we'll see. And these two stars here, on the other side of the Dipper, in the other direction, point to the alpha star of Leo, known as Regulus. So this is a start in terms of getting a handle on the view of the night sky it's nice to know the ver some constellations so that you have some familiarity when you go outside and take a look. Asterisms, well, they are part of a constellation in general, or constellations. 
they're eye-catching star patterns. So you might notice right on this screen, which is a photograph, the Big Dipper, once again, the most easily recognized pattern in the Northern Hemisphere. And that is part of the full constellation known as Ursa Major, the Great Bear. So here we can see the additional stars that make up not just the tail of the bear, but the rear legs and the, the head and the, the front end and all that. So, But especially in uh, light polluted cities like Chicagoland area, or the suburbs of Chicago, it's pretty difficult to see any of these additional stars. So we see the asterism in the light polluted areas because they consist of the larger stars of the constellation. Here is Cassiopeia. Here is Andromeda and the Great Square of Pegasus again, the Northern Cross. These are all parts of constellations. The Northern Cross is easily visible. Cassiopeia, the beautiful W, the Great Square of Pegasus. Well, here's the full constellation Pegasus, so not shown in the Great Square here is the rest of the story. These legs that go out here. And before we leave, it might be noteworthy, I had to stick in the Andromeda Galaxy, the most distant object that humans can see with the naked eye, the unaided eye, and it is right about there. Don't expect it to look that big, but if you're in relatively dark skies and know just where to look, you can see the Andromeda Galaxy off the Andromeda constellation. Well, two great asterisms, very common ones, well-known ones, the great triangle asterisms. We have the winter triangle and we have the summer triangle. And the winter triangle, again, is associated with Orion. Betelgeuse forms one of the stars. Procyon, if you follow the shoulders of Orion, the Procyon, the alpha star of Canis Minor, and down in this direction, the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, the alpha star of Canis Major. And then in the so that's a, a, a asterism that's very well seen in the in the fall and winter. And then in the summer we have the Great Summer Triangle, Altair of Aquila, alpha star there, Vega of Lyrae, it's a very bright star. And then we have Deneb of Cygnus, the Northern Cross. So an asterism amongst an asterism we have there. Two great triangles. Worthy of your recognition. Well, just to point out that the asterisms, in this case we have the, the winter triangle again, not just confined to a constellation, but in this case it's part of three constellations and actually the geographic region is spread out over four constellations. I thought I'd throw this in here just because it's not just a graphic but a fortuitous image. During the Gemini meteor shower of 2009 we have a nice bright meteor piercing the darkness of the sky and you may notice that it's piercing Orion. There's the sword of Orion, the belt, Betelgeuse, Rigel, and that beautiful flash through there. By the way if you follow the Belt of Orion over to the left, you hit Sirius, that's the alpha star of Canis Major. And off to the other side, we see Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. It's a very close and wonderful, beautiful naked eye object, open cluster object that's uh, wonderful to see in the night sky. Well, how do we determine angular distances in the sky. Well, you can do it with the Starry Night Program, the very high degree of specificity, having it measure it out. But if you're just walking outside and you want to know basically the, the angular extent of things, there's a couple rules of thumb. So here I'm showing that the two end stars of the Big Dipper that point to Polaris, it's about a five degree angle from the from your eyes or the tip of your nose to subtend across these two stars is about five degrees. Likewise the moon. This is perhaps more useful. A half a degree 
approximately a half a degree subtended from your nose to the each side of the moon. Well, so here's kind of the rule of thumb. Your f outstretched finger is about a one degree approximately, you know, anatomy of different people is different, but about one degree stretched out. The hand span is 20 degrees and the fist is about 10 degrees. So that gives the ability to quickly make significant angular measurements across the sky. So you want to go, say you're wanting to go 30 degrees up from the horizon, about three fists stacked on top of each other will get you there. That's pretty cool. Well, a little more detail on what angles are that will kind of serve us a little bit as we go forward. We measure distances between objects as angles. So a full circle, as you probably know, is 360 degrees. Okay. And then if you take one degree, this is an exaggeration of that, that splits into 60 minutes. So one minute of arc is 1 60th of one degree. And then moreover, one second, a second of arc, is this little tiny amount of a minute, which is 1 60th of a minute. And so there's 60 seconds in one minute. And that's a really, really tiny angle, equivalent to putting a period from the end of a sentence on one end of a football field, and then a little thin line at the at each edge of that period and have it converge to a point on your nose at the other end of the football field. That is a tiny angle. A second of arc is known as an arc second. That's the term that's used and astronomers use that because the objects that we're observing are so far away and the angles are subsequently extraordinarily tiny. Well this slide will just be a little bit more mathematical, which we may use in uh, exercises or lab activity. It's such a useful formula, even if we don't use it extensively, I want you to be familiar with it, which is relating angle, diameter, and distance to an astronomical object. So, here's the basic formula. S is equal to r theta. I know that's impressive. Let me say it a different way. The diameter of an object way out there is equal to the distance to that object times the angular diameter. And of course, the distance is the easiest thing to think about probably, that's this. The diameter itself is this dimension, whether it's meters, kilometers, miles, whatever. The actual size of the object, that's the diameter. The angular diameter is simply the angle subtended across that object that converges on you. So that's the formula. And what's wonderful about that is that you can determine distances to objects if you know their size, because you can always measure the angle. Or if you know the distance, you can determine the size of a galaxy, a planet, a comet, whatever. And so here's the formula in a little bit more detail after you convert it so that it is in units that are useful. So the angular diameter over 206265, this number here, is simply to make it work so that the angular diameter is in arc seconds. All right, so it's just a conversion factor. That's the linear diameter divided by the distance. So here it is in shorthand form. Theta diameter over 206265 is linear diameter over distance. So file that away in your memory so that if it gets jogged in the future of this course, you'll know where to go find it.